I'm going to begin this series of lectures about ancient Greek civilization with a recent letter from the president of Phi Beta Kappa. I'm a proud member of Phi Beta Kappa, as are my mother, my mother-in-law, and my oldest daughter. And Mr. Churchill says, in a very influential book, After Virtue, some decades back, the philosopher Alistair McIntyre made the case that every living tradition is composed in part by a continuing argumentative inquiry, even dispute, concerning its nature and ends. We might be tempted to regard a tradition as an unchanging heritage, past intact and inviolate from generation to generation. But in fact, as McIntyre writes in another work, quote, a tradition is an argument extended through time in which certain fundamental agreements are defined and redefined. The stipulation that we were talking about a living tradition means that the life and relevance of a tradition includes centrally ongoing contention as to what it is that constitutes that tradition. In other words, there'll be disagreement and argument and built-in impulse to reflection and self-criticism. Without such a dynamic principle, presumably, a tradition ossifies, unresponsive to the changes in its environment. Life is change. In this spirit, we hear posed questions like this. What will education in the arts and sciences be in 20 years or in 50? Or what will become of the disciplines we look to for a definition of the arts and sciences, themselves now little more than a century or two old? Most immediately pressing, perhaps, we hear and pose ourselves. However changed and adapted, how will the impulse of arts and science education fare in the face of widespread indifference to their value? This question defines the project to which Phi Beta Kappa is committed. We are making sure that the conversation about the purposes of higher education in America include pride of place for the recognition that the arts and sciences open opportunity for a broad swath of American students. We want to make sure it's understood that the arts and sciences are the wellspring of in ingenuity and innovation to move our society forward, and that resources devoted to the arts and sciences are an investment in the future. Well, I want to do my version of uh, ancient Greek civilization and its relevance in the era of globalization for a number of reasons. First of all, one thing I really like about the tradition is that it is extremely self-critical. It is not doctrinal. It almost forces you to get into a conversation. It's asking for that kind of dialogue and argument. Look, all the people in Homer and Hesiod and the tragedies and Plato, they're all yelling at each other. Even the gods and goddesses, they're always arguing. They're on both sides of the war. They're, so you don't have this one doctrine to be fixated on. It's not the way the system works. And I'll explain in another lecture about the point of the system is to educate the power of noose and the nature of noose. And I think Greek paideia, the educational system, is designed to trigger and activate that particular power. And they had incredible insight about what that power is. Um, so the reason why I'm motivated to make my own set of videos is because I haven't run into a lot of scholars who start, who interpret Plato. I was a Plato scholar. I am a Plato scholar. And I, I've i met many Plato and Aristotle scholars, but most of us, to get a, a degree, we study it through the filter of, first of all, who is ever trendy at the time, whoever is publishing in the best journals or whatever, 
But even then, so much of Plato and Aristotle is read through filters that were added on after they lived. So, so I have spent seven summers living in Athens, one sabbatical. I started out writing about Plato, and then it got to tragedy and Aristotle, and then I had to go to Homer, and then, of course, Greek myth. And so I tried to put all the pieces together, and I tried to think about what was Plato thinking? What was his life like? What, what was, you know, what's he about? Why did he start his school? What do his dialogues tell us about not only life and truth, but what he learned from his own situation that he thought he could pass on? Some insights to posterity. He was worried about trying to pass on wisdom to the next generation and to the future as were everybody else in that tradition. So um, that's my goal, is to very much see it as a dynamic tradition, one that's designed to trigger active thinking. I certainly wish that I could speak to anybody who um, is watching my videos. You can always email me. Um, martha.beck at lyon, l-y-o-n dot e-d-u, and we can get into some kind of conversation. It's not that hard these days, but uh, that's about the best I can do. The other thing is that I want, when you read a paper at a conference, it's, a, it's 12 pages, it's nothing, it's a tiny, tiny little piece of your intellectual life, of your moral life, of what you think and who you are. So I thought I would do a series, pretty large number of videos, so that people would choose which issues are of interest to them, but they could see that the same person can have these different thoughts about a lot of different things, but they're all consistent with one world view. There's one overall view that is the glue that hangs it all together. And for me, it's the life of the mind, or noose. I think that Plato is giving us an image of so Socrates, who, and I'll say Socrates, but the Greeks say Socrates. Um, he is literally embodying the truth. He is, his way of life is the way of life the rest of us should incarnate in the way we live, in the way we feel, in the way we talk, in the choices we make. So I'll talk about that. I'll also argue that Socrates has all those powers of soul that constitute wisdom as Aristotle defines them. Again, that's not a common view, but I have hundreds of pages of evidence, text, um, and then I'll talk about how the characters in tragedy manifest the different virtues and vices in Aristotle, and the lessons that the tragedians wanted to teach us, and I'll do some with Homer, and I'll do a little with Hesiod. Um, Homer and Hesiod are not my areas of specialization, but um, again, <laughs> the people who wrote, Homer, Hesiod, whoever added to the stories, they're not specialists. They're people who specialize in living and wanting to live well and wanting to be wise. That's the only specialization you should want. And I do think it is important to pass on a tradition of liberal learning. And I mean... <laughs> Plato's pretty central to the Western version of liberal learning and Homer and these folks. So I thought, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to take a stand on why I think they're still worth reading, thinking about, arguing about, but also applying to present 
day. So I will apply it to feminism. I will apply it to the United Nations. I will apply it to systems thinking, environmental ethics, all sorts of things, because they need to be adapted and applied to our lives today. Otherwise, it's just an old fuddy-duddy scholar sitting here in our office without any awareness of what's going on around her. But I'm aware, and I think I can't help it. I in my life, I'll be roaming around, something will happen, and, and instantly a Greek tragedy or an Aristotelian definition or a Platonic dialogue just instantly comes to mind. And so what I've done over the years is ask myself, why does it come to mind? What's going on? To get the theory and the cause, as Aristotle says. Because if you have the cause, as he says in the metaphysics, you can teach. You can't necessarily act real well in a situation, and I tend to underreact in a lot of situations, but if you keep pursuing the cause, you can teach. And so I'm just going to give it a shot, and I hope somebody benefits from my project. Okay, now that I've finished the 74 videos, um, I just wanted to tell people, remind people once more that I'm not a specialist in Hesiod or Homer, and I just did the broad themes, but if scholars, professionals um, feel kind of disgusted at my efforts, they could go to Plato or Aristotle on tragedy because those are things I've studied longer. And I do have, what, 17 videos on Plato. And those would be the things that other professionals, I think, would be interested in. And I would like to get engaged in conversations about the patterns that I see in Plato's dialogues and how they fit with um, the other patterns, what Plato learned from his tradition and how he modified it to fit his own particular um, leap in social evolution. I think he felt like every generation was supposed to be more evolved. They were supposed to take the best from the past and incorporate it into something new and sophisticated and something that addressed the problems of his time in a way that, again, you could pass on the legacy to future generations and they would get the main patterns. And then with Aristotle and his virtues and vices and his notion of practical wisdom and how it applies to tragedy and Greek education for reversal and recognition, I think that is serious stuff. And I would hope to engage professionals and non-professionals alike. Um, and then on the things on Homer and Hesiod, um, I would love to learn from people who actually have specialized and thought about it a lot more than I have. I just had to do the broad sweep. And if there are other areas like the goddesses in Crete or something that people would like to engage me in, that's great. Um, my particular website is martha.beck at lyon, L-Y-O-N, dot E-D-U. And I am old-fashioned. I still like emails. I don't tend to check Facebook as much as other people do and um, LinkedIn and all that. It, it gets to be too much. I really like to read, write, and think. And I will keep posting things after number 74. Uh, but this is, um, this is where I've gotten so far, and I had to draw the line at some point. Okay, that's it.